This is an excerpt from Ascended Masters and Their Retreats, compiled by Werner Schroeder from the Ascended Master Teaching Foundation, and it's from the Bridge to Freedom material. So presented here are some of the highlights and brief descriptions of historical events which occurred during the last embodiment of beloved Jesus. Preparation for the Mission Jesus was born at a time when the collective, constructively qualified energy of the earth was at its lowest level since the days of Atlantis. His coming and successful mission turned the tide. Jesus was born without karma. According to a dictation given by Jesus in 1953, in previous embodiments he was Apollonius from Tyana, Zoroaster in Persia, and Joshua of Biblical account. Jesus' mission had to comply with the laws as they applied to the earth at that time. He did not receive special privileges, such as a gift of consecutive consciousness. He was bound by the bands of forgetfulness, like any other life stream seeking his evolution upon the planet earth. Therefore, when he awoke as a beautiful baby in Mother Mary's arms, or later when he grew older, he did not remember any former embodiments. It was well that a great momentum had been established between Mother Mary and the angelic kingdom, because shortly after the birth of Jesus, an angel brought the news of impending disaster. Mother Mary and Joseph were deeply troubled. Joseph said that he had just received a warning. He was not sure of the source. Was it an angel? Or was it God? The impression on his consciousness was to flee at once and go to Egypt. Joseph had misgivings. He felt it was unfair for a newborn child, having such a mission, to so soon be the subject of the cruelty of Herod. Together they prayed, and Mother Mary received confirmation in her heart that they should go. As behind them the blood of the infants flowed in the streets, Mother Mary, and Jesus later on, vowed then she would personally assist each child that was involved in such an act of brutality to gain the ascension in a future embodiment. These children had died because of their mission. Mother Mary took her small baby and together with Joseph left the shelter of their home and journeyed to Egypt, a land filled with dangerous wildlife. It was a long, tedious ride into Egypt, with many sleepless nights fleeing before Herod's soldiers. When Jesus was a very small boy, he already manifested a purity of spirit. His senses were also well developed. He had perfect sight, perfect hearing, perfect taste, touch and smell. Besides this, he had great intuition. Jesus did not live in a privileged, charmed world. He lived in the midst of so-called imperfection. He was called upon to rub shoulders with the poor and the sick of mind and body. There was no public institutions at that time to remove such individuals from public life. The beautiful boy, dressed in his simple white tunic and the sandals that Joseph had made for him, was exposed to the pressures of thoughts from many planes, with only the love of Mother Mary and Joseph protecting him. Jesus' parents were his earliest teachers. Mother Mary told him that it was entirely up to him to either accept as real the world filled with imperfections, such as the appearances of illness and distress, or to magnify the Lord. Jesus told the students that his lesson helped him immensely in his later mission and preserved his sanity many times. Joseph also often applied this principle. Mother Mary stated, there is always that choice to either tune into and magnify the appearance world or to choose to magnify the power of God by turning the beam of one's energy and attention to one's I am presence, holding one's attention focused there until the inner self gains in confidence. When young Jesus came to Mother Mary with bruises on his feet and knees, she would say, we shall not magnify the hurt or that scar, we shall magnify the Lord. Then turning her attention to the perfect pattern the man made in God's image and likeness, Mother Mary, Joseph and Jesus would draw the healing and peace currents of their God presence through the scars until the appearance of imperfection would disappear. They did this systematically every day. Thus together they built a momentum that was to be the foundation for meeting the difficult days ahead, yes, for overcoming death itself. At the tender age of five, Jesus entered the Temple of Luxor, and, as it was with Mother Mary, the severe discipline of the priests of the temple 
was re-experienced. Mother Mary was not permitted to witness his training. She had to wait outside the temple in the hot sun, shaded by a fig tree, while young Jesus received instructions from early morning until well into the afternoon. Sometimes after leaving the temple, Mother Mary noticed beads of perspiration on Jesus' forehead and deep circles under his eyes. He had to undergo tests and disciplines from which full-grown men and women have shrunk, yet Mother Mary could not interfere. It was her obligation to give him complete freedom, a freedom within which there was no fear. When Jesus reached maturity with the assistance of Joseph, he became a skilled carpenter. Later on, Joseph made many important contributions in establishing the Christian era. It was he who first introduced Jesus to the disciples. And as we know, Joseph was the beloved ascended master Saint Germain. During Jesus' growing years, it was Joseph's service to be his teacher. When Jesus' contact with the ascended master Lord Betrayer was developed to the point where there was practically no veil between them any more, Lord Betrayer became his new teacher. One day Joseph told Mother Mary that his mission in life was nearly accomplished. He asked her to stay in Bethany after he left this earth plane. There she would be in the hands of friends. Jesus, he said, was to go to India to receive some important message. Shortly thereafter, Joseph passed from this scene of life. Joseph had not been gone very long when Jesus found himself going alone on foot to India in a simple, solitary pilgrimage. He entered India following the vague directions of Joseph, having to depend on his own iron presence. He came upon a group of people seated around a teacher and sat silently with them. The teacher's name was the great divine director and ascended master. The master did not greet Jesus, but mentally projected to him the words, I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the ascension in the light. That was the entire contact between Jesus and the teacher. Jesus got up and walked back home, grateful that he had received the key words for his mission. After Jesus returned from India, proud to his public ministry, he and Mother Mary went back to Luxor in Egypt. There they stayed for three years. Both of them mastered the final initiation of the Luxor retreat, which is the conscious removal of the life currents from the body and the returning of them through the controlled breath. This was done to prepare them for Jesus' supreme test. Twelve masters stood, watched over their bodies during that period, and both Jesus and Mother Mary passed the test victoriously, performing his mission. Jesus' mission started at the age of 30. His ministry lasted three years. This three-year time limit was predestined by cosmic law. He spoke in simple terms and in easy-to-understand parables, so that the man on the street could understand. From a spiritual viewpoint, Jesus touched less than 500 life streams. This was partially due to the difficult conditions of travel prevailing at that time. During the time Jesus was engaged in his mission, Mother Mary stayed with Martha and the other Mary, possibly Mary of Bethany, on the outskirts of Bethany. Here there was an old mill that had been used to grind corn. There was a certain peacefulness in the simplicity of the country living. Mother Mary enjoyed this environment and wove garments for Jesus. Once a day, she walked up a small and grassy mound to a great flat-topped rock. There she spent several hours in deep and earnest communion with God. In this manner, she built the momentum and the pattern upon which Jesus and Mother Mary later ascended. When Jesus rested between trips, he visited Mother Mary at Bethany, and in those moments both found happiness during this difficult time. Jesus' first so-called miracle was the changing of water into wine at the wedding in Cana. He turned his attention to God and through the energies of his spiritual momentum changed the substance of that water into electronic light. It was the people who unconsciously qualified it with what they desired to manifest. Therefore, the substance they drank tasted to them like wine. The feeding of the 5,000 was accomplished using similar principles. Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish using the law of precipitation. The bread and fish were multiplied by drawing together electronic light substance, the substance which is around us in the atmosphere. 
This substance was drawn into form and then lowered into a lower vibratory level, enabling the people to eat what looked and tasted like fish. As recorded in the book Unveiled Mysteries, Saint Germain used the same concepts of law in giving Mr. Ballard a milky liquid, which was also produced from electronic light substance. This greatly refreshed and revitalized Mr. Ballard. From early childhood, Jesus was taught to magnetize peace. That peace became a great reservoir. It enabled Jesus to say with authority, Peace, be still. The turbulent waters of the Sea of Galilee responded. This feeling of peace was also present when he said, Love your enemies. Treat kindly those who spitefully use you. Invoking all of the gathered momentum of life everlasting and directing that energy into the heart of Lazarus, Jesus was able to render a service. The energy he called forth was more powerful than the moaning, crying, curiosity, skepticism and other qualities of an imperfect nature acting through the people who were present. Lazarus responded and came forth from the so-called dead. While performing his many miracles, Jesus had the spiritual assistance of his mighty God presence, his I Am presence, his teacher Lord Maitreya and his beloved Mother Mary. Jesus in a dictation urged the students to be prepared at all times to use their God-given abilities. One never knows when this opportunity will come. He said, the moment is now. Do not consult the calendar as to when to do a certain thing. I was not told beforehand what to experience. I had no written scroll saying on such and such a date the Holy Spirit would descend and on such and such a date I was to heal. The Master Jesus used his hands almost constantly as conductors of the energy drawn from God, his I Am, and charged them through the electrons of his great life stream with healing power for those requiring assistance. He and his disciples healed by the laying on of hands. In this manner, the electronic particles of the Master's energy were charged into the physical structure, as well as into the mental, emotional and etheric bodies of those requiring assistance. Jesus stated in a dictation to the students in 1961, Through misinterpretation of the law, I was unfortunately set apart as the only begotten Son. I came to bring the example of eternal life, overcoming, through the assistance of divine beings, the experience called death. Then I had to convince my disciples that I still lived and moved among them, resurrected. All of these things I did because the world required then and now the coming of a perfect one, who can fulfill the purpose and represent on earth one heavenly Father. Have you ever been whipped in public with a crown of thorns pressed into your brow? Have you had your garments rent? No. The things which have happened to you during this embodiment are very slight compared to those experiences through which I voluntarily passed to show that the Son of God was the master of energy in this world. In 1961, beloved Mother Mary said, The diabolical forces still roam through the world, emphasizing the wrong part of Jesus' mission. They glorify a crucified Christ, muting a resurrected Christ. Jesus' words add emphasis as follows. The crucified Christ, which the Orthodox world places before the people, is the symbol of vicarious atonement. It is the way of the outer self to let some other life stream carry your sin. Vicarious atonement is not possible, because the law, as we sow, so we reap, is immutable. The crucified Christ is to be replaced by the ascended Christ. It is up to each individual to atone for his own sins. Addressing himself to the present accuracy and authenticity of the Bible, the Mahachahan explained in 1960 that there were some biblical scholars who embellished upon the original text. In his dictations, Jesus again and again stressed that the miracles of 2,000 years ago can again be accomplished today by the students. He also mentioned that only since the 1927 dispensation of the I Am activity has the apex of that service been reached, which he expects to render. As a part of this service, opportunity is given to the students of the Ascended Masters as seldom before in the history of the earth. These students, he said, alone are the hope of the earth. Churches have had their opportunities for 2,000 years to set mankind free, yet the people have grown into greater and greater bondage. 
I implore you in the name of the Father of all life, if you love me, do that which I have done. After the disciples and the Master had finished the Last Supper and had gone to Gethsemane, Mother Mary, another person whose name was also Mary, and Martha gathered together the linen cloth which Mother Mary had woven and folded it carefully. Mother Mary knew deep within herself that within one day that cloth would enfold the body of her yet vital, beautiful son. The cup of the Last Supper was wrapped in a napkin and given to Joseph of Arimathea for safekeeping. Then Mother Mary engaged in an earnest prayer, for the next day was to bring the greatest trial of her life. Several times before, Jesus and Mother Mary had discussed the various points that were to be emphasized during his ministry. Often they talked over the necessity of passing through the appearance of death in order to prove the immortality of life. The Ascension While Mother Mary was staying at Bethany, she walked up the hill alone each day, weaving a pattern of light. While on her way, she prayed and sent her love and gratitude to God, sending forth her invocations for Jesus' victory. This pathway of light pierced through the psychic realm, connecting with the consciousness of Vesta. Beloved Vesta is the great goddess of our physical sun, Helios and Vesta, being the head of the hierarchy. Over this pathway, Jesus later would walk in his triumph. The raising of energy from Mary's heart built the pattern of the ascension flame, used to gain Jesus' victory. His ascension was witnessed by 500 people. Jesus appeared to Mother Mary and the disciples, sometimes for minutes, sometimes for hours, for 40 days. In this way, their feelings became anchored in the supremacy of the laws of Almighty God. The disciples had to learn that it is possible for every student of truth to apply the law and have the victory of its manifestation. Beloved Ascended Lady Master Mother Mary said in a dictation, what one has done, all may one day do. Reflections of Jesus Regarding his last embodiment, Jesus explained, My ministry was one of action. Every day before I left the house, great numbers of people had gathered, primarily to receive relief from all manner of discomfort and disease of mind and body. Very few came to learn the application by which I had achieved such prayers to give surcease from distress. I had learned never under any circumstance to go forth to serve until I had first anchored my consciousness, feeling and self in the presence of God, my great I am. Only when I was firmly established in that unshakable faith, that indescribable fortress of his power and presence, would I endeavor to convey that consciousness of his goodness through words and works to my fellow man. Earnest men and women, filled with zeal and enthusiasm, often rush forth without such personal contemplation and communion with the God self. When the fishermen in the boat were sore distressed because of the raging seas, where did I receive the power which stilled the waters? I had, through the assistance of both my mother and father and Lord Maitreya, been taught from childhood to magnetize peace. That peace became a great reservoir, and so I said to the waters, Peace, be still. And naturally they responded, because there was more energy already drawn around me, qualified with God peace, than all of the turbulence of the Sea of Galilee. Before I came into the world of form, I was charged with a mission to manifest unto all mankind the full perfection of our Father who is in heaven, referring to his great iron presence. You were also so charged when you were created. Now your mission is similar to my own. Jesus asked the students of the Bridge to Freedom to decree with feeling. He said that no decree had efficacy until it is accompanied with great feeling. After his ascension, Jesus became the Chohan of the Sixth Ray, and on January the 1st of 1956, Jesus, together with beloved Lord Kathumi, became world teachers. Ascended Lady Masanada took over the position of the Chohan at that time, which is now held by John the Beloved. Jesus and Mother Mary are functioning today as Harrochs of the Resurrection Temple. We can call to them to blaze the resurrection flame through our bodies to restore them to their original condition of youth and health. The keynote of beloved Ascended Master Jesus is found in the song, Joy to the World. We were later told by dictations given to other members of the Philadelphia group that Jesus is from the angelic kingdom. He is the great cosmic angel, Mecca, the angel of unity, and is extremely active in helping beloved Saint Germain at this critical time as we transition into the new and permanent golden age.